G'day everyone there in the Yarra Valley. This is a recording of a slideshow presented at the AWRI uh, Regional Workshop um, for the Yarra Valley in July 2017. I'm Graham Anderson, work with Agriculture Victoria. Um, we have a number of products and we deliver uh, seasonal variability and climate um, risk sessions right across the state. Now one of the things we'll talk about is just looking at the last two vintages. Here's the uh, rainfall for 2016 for the whole 12 months and you can see that um, there's quite a lot of Australia that was um, sort of in the decil 10 or decil 8 and 9 and we were sort of average down in this part of the world but average or wetter over the most of the state and we'll talk about where all of that moisture came from. The previous year though, 2015, we had an El Nino in the Pacific and uh, it does make parts of uh, the country dry and you can see down in this part of the world was decile 1 which is equivalent of, of the driest 10% of long term record or decile 2 to 3 so uh, so we'll talk about those two springs because they're quite different vintages. And uh, here's a little climate uh, application uh, you can go to it's called Climate AustralianClimate.net.au you can download lots of rainfall um, nearest um, weather stations records but here it is for Healesville um, and this is just showing things like how's the season progressing this year for rainfall. So this is from January through to this year. The red line's where we are this year. The blue line is the long term average. You can see all of the different, the range of different um, seasons there. So that's a good little lap. As you can see, we're going along pretty close to average there this year. We're going to look at long term rainfall record now. This is uh, Victoria's rainfall from all the weather stations in Victoria back to 1900. And you can see rainfall. Uh, goes up and down a lot of variability. Uh, average doesn't happen that often. But you'll also notice in the last 20 years um, we've had about four years above the long term average and 16 below. So we'll talk about what's going on, what's behind these sort of wetter years and wetter years like last year uh, and also is there anything going on with this sort of dry pattern. So here's a long term rainfall record from Lilydale back to 1886 all the way through to last year. You can see a lot of variability there. This is millimetres up the side so some years there's barely 600 mils of rainfall and some years it's over 1200. So you can see a lot of variability. Um, I guess one of the things is just in the last uh, 20 years we've had 15 drier and 5 wetter than average. Um, so last year was one of those wetter years um, and we'll talk about what was behind that the things that Indian Ocean Dipole. And here's that little day of record looking at summer, autumn, winter and spring rainfall. So you can see a lot of variability throughout the record there but probably a few drier autumns thrown in there compared to long term average and drier winters um, as well. Probably the two seasons misbehaving there compared to long term average. And you can see those two different springs there, uh, 2015 quite dry and uh, 2016 a um, bit above average. Just looking at another site now going further up the hill you can see Maroondah Weir uh, quite wetter um, over 1100 mils rainfall average 1893 here all the way through to last year. You can see a lot of variability in the record there um, but also again when you look at the last 20 years um, there's only been three above average and uh, uh, 17 have been dry. So often as you head up the hills and the higher rainfall signs they're the ones that are showing a bit more of that dry pattern. They still get a lot of rainfall, you can see those even in their driest year they're still getting over 600 mil but um, it does have a broader impact on some of the catchments. Also here's that seasonal for Maroondah Weir, summer rainfall, autumn, winter and spring. You can probably see there um, autumns tend to be a bit drier and the same as a run of drier winters there too. Probably spring, um, it's probably certainly been a few more drier ones there than winter. So what's behind the uh, wetter and dry years down in our, pa our part of the world? You can see here uh, we happen to live at, at the place of the crossroads of four big climate drivers and to make rainfall basically we need two things. First of all we've got to have a really good source of moisture and we get most of our moisture from the warm tropical oceans to our north and when that moist air hits actually the cold air and you can see all of the cold air whizzes around the southern ocean and we've got all of these cold fronts that queue up and then sweep across southern Australia when that it's a combination of the moisture hitting that reliable sort of source of rainfall triggers that uh, gives us a reliable rainfall and we've got the El Nino Southern Oscillation 
um, it's a good source of moisture the trade winds blow towards Australia it's normally bringing moisture in El Nino years that breaks down and the actual trade winds go backwards or or the moisture's all falling out in the central Pacific and not over here so that's some years that sort of moisture supply can be disappearing um, and out here the Indian Ocean Dipole it was actually a really good source of moisture last year in 2016 lots of extra moisture up here feeding into northwest cloud bands and that fed in and when it hits that colder air down south then uh, it tends to be um, average or wetter years. Um, you can see all of these cold fronts off the um, head around the southern ocean one um, really important triggers one thing some farmers note that uh, you know 30 years ago if they saw a cold front off the coast of Perth they'd expect rain three days later and these days um, you know if you see a cold front there uh, we tend to more often watch it slip to the south. So we'll talk a little bit about what's going on there. One of the things with the seasonal forecasting and the difference between wetter and dry years, this is looking at a sea surface temperature anomaly map. So the, uh, the temperatures along the equator here are always a lot warmer. So that's warm water to swim in and it's always cooler down here. But this is an anomaly map which means it's comparing the temperatures compared to long-term average. So we're going back to a dry pattern here, September 2006. You can see a lot of really extra warm water over here. This sort of color is where the water might be um, one to two degrees warmer than long-term average, and the blue is where water's one to two degrees cooler than long-term average. So here's a dry pattern because we've got an El Nino happening out here, and we've got this sort of cooler than average water happening to north of Australia. Now all of the extra cloud and moisture, flooding rains and everything would be happening over here, this side of the Pacific when that's going on. Um, and all of the cloud over the warmest part of the ocean there. And when this is happening then there's a lot less moisture to go to feed into our weather making. So that's a typical dry pattern. Um, look at the sea surface temperature map here um, when we say go to a wetter uh, season like the spring of 2010. Okay, here we've got October 2010, it's a wetter pattern, we've got a La Nina in the Pacific and cooler water there and all of this extra warm water, um, actually some record warm water that popped up that year, generating heaps of cloud over this part of the world and heaps of moisture that fed into our rainfall patterns that year. So. Um, so that's really what a lot of seasonal forecasting is about, just trying to work out where's all of that warmest water and all of that extra cloud and moisture. Is it uh, right in our part of the world or is it somewhere else? And looking at that pattern there, 2010, you can see that was where that warmer water was, but you can see here this is where the, the cloud anomaly is. So these, um, this colour here is where there's been extra cloud and you can see that we're full of that warmer water there. There's been a lot of extra cloud and that feeds into our weather patterns and increases the chance of a wetter year when that's happening. And when we look at those dry years like the September 2006, the cooler water is in our part of the world to the north. You can see here this is where there's a lot less cloud around and uh, again when there's less cloud and moisture coming from up there it's, there's less moisture to feed into our, our weather patterns. So when we go through the local rainfall records, if you put them all from the driest years in a row up to the wettest, you get these tersiles, the driest third of years, the wettest third and that in between. So we're going to just look at the local rainfall record and see if this is the standard pattern and see if there's any different in this pattern when we look at El Nino or Indian Ocean Dipole years effect on that local seasonal rainfall. So when we look at Lilydale's rainfall record, and here's El Nino years when it's a bit drier, and we're looking here at the August-November periods, uh, drier here, and you can see rather than a third of those uh, years being drier at Lilydale, well, two, two out of three were drier, so it really doubles the chance of a drier spring. So the fingerprints of El Nino are there, but it doesn't guarantee dry. You can see some of them were average or or slightly wetter. When the lanoon is firing up and there's extra moisture floating around that feeds in down here and you can see that again at Lanina a much greater chance of getting you know wetter years or or wetter averages reduces the chance of dry but it can still happen but largely often that's what a lot of seasonal forecasting is about is just uh, it, it changes the odds from year to year. And here's the Indian Ocean Dipole um, at Lilydale when we look through the records certainly when it's being in its drier phase you can see quite a strong signature there of increasing chance of drier and years like last year when the Indian Ocean Dipole is in its wetter phase you can see it really reduces the chance of having a dry year. And if we look at that Maroondah uh, Reservoir 
you can see again big influence of El Nino up there um, also the idominance is dry phase and again the wetter phases of La Nina from the Pacific reducing the chance of drier and the IOD like last year um, you know bigger chance of wetter on average so that's a uh, key key drivers those two in terms of the moisture supply for wetter or drier years and here's the sea surface temperature map pattern for where we are in July this year and so it's interesting that um, there's been some early discussions about whether an El Nino would develop out here but it hasn't yet and basically right along the whole equator it's all warm so there's no really strong El Nino or driver there happening at the minute but you'd largely say that you know there is pl plenty of ocean there that um, you know still a, a good moisture source for potential rainfall this year. Um, this one there's been a little bit of a watch on to see we don't want to see too much cooler water up there and that's what a lot of the forecasters are watching to to so that um, uh, this area doesn't go blue over the spring. Um, one of the things also that's been happening of recent uh, this is pressure pattern and these color here are lower areas of lower pressure and the red is sort of areas of higher pressure this is just through uh, May and June and one thing we have had while there's no strong El Nino uh, underway we do have had more than a fair share of pressure and that's been um, hanging around a bit this year so a lot of the forecasting is trying to look at well will that continue or not now there's a range of seasonal um, forecast models throughout, throughout uh, the, the globe really. We've got the Bureau of Meteorology does um, you know, one to three to six month forecasts. We've got uh, the European model, um, there's, uh, there's the Erie model in the US, we've got uh, the UK model as well and there's a you know, Japanese, Chinese, Koreans, there's a whole lot of global forecast models where they're trying to look at well what are, where is the oceans going to be delivering most of the moisture in the coming months. So Dale Gray uh, with uh, Agriculture Victoria puts these together. Here's a number of different models. This is a, in a, a newsletter that you can subscribe to. It's free. Um, just drop an email to the.break at ecodev.vic.gov.au. Dale goes through each month, looks at all of those different climate models, the European model, the, the, the Bureau's model, the Japanese, NSEP, NASA, Japan. These are the model runs for July, for August, September, October what they think will be happening in the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean Dipole, and then whether they think Victoria uh, might be drier or wetter. So you can see just if this current um, outlook as of July, um, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of those models I've got to um, think Victoria might be a bit drier. So usually in the experience when more than half of these models are starting to say that they think your part of the world is going to be drier, it's worth taking note of. And also the models um, have a four to six month outlook. So Dale puts that together as well. And this is for November, December, January. Um, interesting there, we can see there's a couple with a bit of drier hint, but there's also what's popping into the forecast, those longer forecasts is a few thinking slightly wetter, especially in parts of Eastern Victoria. So four to six months is a fair way out, but you'd be watching that over the coming months and to see if that wetter signal stays there. Um, and uh, so that's what the seasonal forecast um, update in the fast break. There's um, basically up to date commentary on that and how things are shaping up for Victoria. Right, so what I've talked about is the key drivers behind our seasonal variability. Now, is there anything different going on? So here we've got maximum temperatures uh, records for Victoria going back to 1910, and you can see summer, autumn, winter, and spring. While there's a lot of variability in that record, you can see that for all of those seasons, the last 10, 20 years, we've been consistently a lot warmer. And I guess with climate change, the Bureau will explain it that we're basically squeezing in an extra month of summer. So most of those seasons are all warmer, um, winter's milder, but of interest is um, spring's our fastest warming season. You can see the last 10 years there, we've had a number of springs that have been between 1 to even 3 degrees warmer than long-term average. And what's interesting here is that last year, 2016, we had a year that was pretty close to average. Um, and then uh, 2015, that spring was almost uh, 2 to 3 degrees warmer than long-term average. So a really big difference in temperatures between those two. And what we've got here, this is just that spring temperatures for last year. 2016 we're pretty close to average we had because we had a wetter year there was a lot of extra cloud and that tended to just keep averages um, you know the temperatures pretty close to average there 
when we look at the spring of 2015 you can see it was quite warm over a lot of Australia and for down in the southern parts we were you know up into the highest um, warmest spring on record so two very different springs which um, left their mark on on the, the grapevines and it, you can see that pattern there that's the previous year 2014 so these sort of colors here are decile 10 temperatures or, or you know hottest 10 percent of years or on record so um, very warm 2013 2012 2011 too so that's part of a broader pattern of those warmer springs happening more often now one of the things just reading this paper in, uh, recently which was just talking about um, um, looking at the relationship between viticultural climate indices and grape maturity and uh, it just looked at uh, a number of vineyards in Victoria and across Australia and saying that daily heat summations for the months of September, October and November showed the best correlation to the day of year of maturity suggesting that springtime temperatures were an important relative to the timing of grape maturity. So I guess when you look at those um, last two years of 2015 being really warm um, it sort of fired things up early so you had earlier harvest and then um, last year was closer to average um, in terms of spring which reflected in the vintage um, harvest dates. Something that's also a little bit different compared to normal here is um, pressure over southern Australia since 1950 where it's been getting a bit stronger. So you can see this region of southern Australia. Um, this is a pressure pattern. Um, some years are the pressure stronger and uh, they're typically El Nino years but you can also see there that that variability uh, has a trend line about it so every now and then we pump into higher pressure. So that's something that I expect as the world gets warmer um, you know the pressure pattern over southern Australia was expected to get stronger and that's what's happened when it's actually being measured. And one of the things just um, to note this is that pressure again and just looking at uh, the June we just had this year um, we actually broke a record there uh, for pressure. And uh, that's June rainfall for 2017 and you can see um, some southern areas of, of Australia that had either decile 1 or lowest on record. So that sort of, you know, when the pressure's higher it's used, tends to be not very helpful for, for rainfall squeezes, um, more weather to our south. Also what happens when we get, uh, um, you know, high pressure, well we can get warmer daytime temperatures and so the, the vines wanting to fire up earlier. Um, when we get high pressure, really clear night skies and dry air over us, that can be really conducive to frosts, which we've noticed this year too. Um, but also one of the things, um, while uh, daytime temperatures have been going up, the incidence of spring frosts, and these sort of blue colours here, is just showing that um, uh, in some areas there's just as many or even uh, the risk of August to November frosts is is um, just as bad as it was or in some areas it's getting a bit worse and that's just because of that rising pressure pattern so not so bad down south but it is one of those issues I guess that if the pressure pattern continues to rise then that risk of late frost um, still hangs around. Um, the last bit just on climate change projections looking into the future this is where with a lot of the climate models when they put them all um, together and say well if the world's a bit warmer um, where might it rain more or less and so these colours here are showing where uh, in a warmer world the models expecting it might get a bit wetter um, this is where they're, they're a bit mixed and these areas are where the models think it'll be more likely to be drier so you can see along southern Australia quite different to um, perhaps northern Australia largely that the, in a warmer world the tropics expands from the equator pushes everything south so that just sort of means that southern Australia is likely to be a bit drier what's interesting is this is the actual observed rainfall for our, our, um, April to October uh, since 97. So what's been observed has just been those dry bits down south which happens to include us uh, and that's what they expected and, and that's largely what's been playing out. Still a lot of variability but, but, that, but mainly to do with that rising pressure pattern. And another good way of looking at it, this is some work done by uh, David Steves Stevens from the Australian Export Grains Innovation Centre who's looking at rainfall seasonality for the last hundred years and then compared that to the rainfall seasonality since 2000. So obviously we have areas that um, are summer dominated rainfall zones um, and strongly winter dominated rainfall zones 
but that was up to 2000 and then he just looked at what's happened in the last 16 years and what it found was that most of those zones had shifted south so they so uh, and it's a pretty good way of looking at it in terms of future climates that basically most of our climate zones get shifted south now there's um successful farming and agriculture happening over all sorts of climate zones so it's um, not climate zone that determines your lot but it the adjusting as the zone changes that does mean that um, we've often got to adjust our practices or and varieties or whatever as as we deal with changing seasons so there's lots being done to uh, tackle variability in climate change on farms lots of great stuff and there's lots of things in our favor with modern day technologies and R&D genetics and innovations which all serve as well also improve on farm and all regional infrastructure is really important and particularly for a lot of farms down south that we've um, water storage and, and water security is a really key one because we've probably just got to be planning for every now and then the odd dry year or years where there's a bit less runoff so um, looking at what our plan a b and c is there um, lots of things in the favour with growth in um, local and export markets also um, some biosecurity issues we've got to stay on top of that really important um, having business management for variable years and income has always been a really key important thing and it'll only get more important um, having good farm plans looking after soils and and basically looking after our, our natural assets when they're going through either the big droughts or the big wet periods that's always been important and will be and also just looking at our soils and how can we improve the health of our soils so that um, perhaps if we're uh, making sure that in um, if we're getting some the occasional bigger rainfall event that our soils are set up to soak up more water and store it there for our plants so they can access it when they need to so soil health is a really important adaptation measure and one of the key things of course which is what the workshops are all about making sure that you've got really good networks and knowledge channels um, so that as we go through each season we can all share what's worked what hasn't and uh, um, and then just plan that into the, the next season so I hope that's been of use uh, if you um, would like to get those seasonal updates uh, monthly updates just drop an email to the break at um, ecodev.vic.gov.au and all the best